From the studios of the Optimism Institute, welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Burke, and in every Blue Sky episode, we'll be speaking to leaders, researchers, and thinkers whose stories and insights will remind us that there is always blue sky above. Sometimes you just have to get your head above the clouds to see it. If you ask a sample of people to make a list of the characteristics of today's society that get them down, at or near the top of most would be the vitriolic, uncivil discourse that seems to be all around us. My guest today is concerned enough about this that she's written an entire book on the subject. Her name is Alexandra Hudson. She goes by Lexi, and her book is The Soul of Civility, Timeless Principles to Heal Society and ourselves. Lexi Hudson is a writer, popular speaker, and the founder of Civic Renaissance, a publication and intellectual community dedicated to beauty, goodness, and truth. She was named the 2020 Novak Journalism Fellow and contributes to Fox News, CBS News, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Time Magazine, Politico Magazine, and Newsweek. She earned a master's degree in public policy at the London School of Economics as a Rotary Scholar and as an adjunct professor at the Indiana University Lilly School of Philanthropy. She's also the creator of a series for the teaching company called Storytelling and the Human Condition, now available for streaming. She lives in Indianapolis, Indiana with her husband and children. I hope you enjoy this Blue Sky conversation with Lexi Hudson as much as I did. Lexi Hudson, welcome to the Blue Sky podcast. I'm so thrilled to be here, Bill. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate all the effort you put into your terrific book, The Soul of Civility. I love books. I worked on one myself, and I'm one of those weird people who always reads the acknowledgments. And I was glad I did on yours because I want to start with a quote. Tyler Cowen is a friend of yours. And I love this quote. He said, only write a book if you feel like you have a disease and writing a book is the cure. He was trying to talk you out of it and yet you still wrote this book. So can you help our listeners? What is the disease you feel like this society has and why do you hope or how will your book be the cure? So it's so it's such a great piece of advice. And Tyler is just a wonderful human being and so eccentric and delightful and fabulous. And he loves being like counterintuitive. But I mean, this is like great practical advice. Like so many people yes. want to have written a book. Yes. And writing a book is super hard. Yes. And, you know, Tyler is like, there are way easier paths to fame and fortune, you know, <laughs> right. way easier ones. No one writes a book, <laughs> to, you know, to, to have surefire fame and fortune. And he's like, you know, if, that, if that's your goal, do the, do other those other things. But writing a book is super hard. Yeah. And as, as, as you said, like only write a book if you have a disease that is killing you and then writing this book is the cure. Yeah. And my disease was that I just had this book inside me. Part of I part of this project I've been marinating and reflecting on and contemplating on these ideas the timeless principles of human flourish and the nature of the good life. My entire life I've been thinking about these ideas. And we can talk about, you know, my mother and my father, my mom's the manners lady, my dad's a philosopher and so like I've just been, you know, these 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 are formative kind of questions in my in my mind. And but it was it was really an environment of like the anti-good life, of like anti-human flourishing. All of these kind of common niceties and decencies and courtesies, like just basic respect for personhood and dignity that I kind of taken for granted my entire life were just absent. It was this environment, again, of anti-human flourishing. And my experience was really a microcosm of the deep divisions in our world as a whole, in our country, but in our, and in, in, in kind of the, 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 I, I've just gotten back yesterday from book tour on the continent. I was in Europe and, and, uh, and France and, and the UK and democracies around the world, half the globe is going to the polls this year and democracies around the world are grappling with these deep threats to, to democracy, political extremism, the threats of political violence, hyper-partisanship. Democracies around the world are grappling with these, and my book is about the duties of citizenship and and the timeless principles of human flourishing. We're not the first or only society to have thought about this or had these challenges. Democracy is new, but this challenge of life together is not new. I I I couldn't not write this book. I was so overwhelmingly despised 
despondent by my experience in government. Um, I did not feel like I was any part of a solution to the deep divisions in our world right now, the brokenness, the loneliness, the alienation um, in our world. And I, I wrote this book hoping, praying that it is just a small part of the solution and helping us think more clearly about the duties of citizenship, but also at kind of a broader level, making the world a more gentle and, and beautiful place for my children to grow up in. That's a really savage, cruel world. And if my book can just help people uh, just be a little more gentle, you know, and, and we, we don't really, we, we prize hardness, you know, imperviousness, invulnerability, but like life together requires softness. It requires vulnerability. That's like this, that's the stuff of the good life. Well, and, and you mentioned your mom and so quickly, because I, I want to dive in more to some of the things you talk about in, in the actual book, but it helps to understand where you're coming from, because a lot of the time we'll talk about the difference between politeness and civility or manners and civility. Your mom was not just writing. Your mom was Judy, the manners lady. Can you, some of our listeners will, will remember. Can you talk about what that was like to grow up with Judy, the manners lady as your mom? My mom is the best. Like she's just the best human being you'll ever meet or ever know. She is just unendingly kind and thoughtful and other oriented and courteous, courteous, almost to a fault where she is just always thinking of others to the point where it kind of drives me crazy sometimes. <laughs> right, but like, right. you know, she was just on book tour with me in Europe and, you know, she's been, she's been in, you know, close to 40, 50 cities with me uh, and my two kids helping me with the kids while, you know, supporting me in my oh, work. Nice. And she is just the greatest champion of, of others. And she's passionate about the human social project and passionate about manners to the extent that they support this project of living well together. She she builds community and friendship wherever she goes, which is the absolute antidote to this broken, alienated, and divided time that we live in. Fantastic. Well, yeah, it'd be hard not to be influenced by a mom like that. So so it, your book's called The Soul of Civility, and you spent a lot of time that was very helpful to me distinguishing between civility and politeness. And I'll just share a few things from your book that really helped me. First of all, I love the roots of words, etymology, and I did not know. The polite comes from the Latin polire, which means to polish or make smooth. So, and and you describe politeness as being more of a technique, more just sort of compliance, but civility is much harder. It's much deeper. And what I really like, you said, it, you're motivated in civility to what we view, you, you have to view others as moral equals and worthy of our respect. So it's a much deeper level or higher level, if you will, than just politeness. Can you talk some more about that? Because I think it's a really important di difference because a lot of us know people who can be incredibly polite while they're you know, stabbing you in the back, right? So <laughs> there's a big difference. So could you just amplify that a little bit? Shakespeare's this great line. I think it's from Othello. He goes, one way smile, smile and be a villain. You know, like we're all familiar right. with these experiences, these people that are are polished and poised and polite, but ruthless and cruel. Yeah. You can, you know, even, I don't know if you've spent time in the South, Bill, but like, you know, the bless your heart. Bless culture, her heart. Right? Like yeah. outwardly that like those words literally seem nice, right? But they're, right. they're, they're, they're actually in the subtext, subtext is, you're an idiot. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, it's very right. patronizing, very condescending. Yeah. So I learned this first time when I was in government where, you know, I, I, I went in armed with the rules of etiquette and propriety and, and hospitality that my mother had modeled and trained my brothers and I in my entire life. And all of a sudden they didn't work anymore. I was in this, in this environment where it was just pure egoism, pure survivalism in federal government. And I saw these two extremes. On one hand, there were people who um, were hostile. They had sharp elbows. They were willing to trample on anyone, silence, steamroll to get ahead. On the other hand, there were people who were polished and poised and polite, but who uh, would smile and flatter me and others one moment and stab us in the back. Yeah, the next. And yeah. this, this contingent deeply perplexed me because one reason my mom is passionate about manners is because she, and, and funnily enough, Emily Post said the same thing a hundred years prior, you know, before my mom even existed, she, and you know, uh, that, that manners were an outward expression of our inward character. And that's why polish and poise and politeness matter. And what I, uh, would, but I, that was refuted by my lived experience where there, there was this mismatch between etiquette and ethics, manners, morals, and these people I, I worked alongside government. So that clarified for me this essential distinction between civility and politeness that is way underrated and way um, overlooked 
So, uh, because today there are two groups, there are two contingents, one, one that says, oh, we just need more civility and politeness in public life, and it will restore comity and harmony in our, in our, in our world today. We just need more civility and politeness. And another group says, no, burn it all down. We need less civility and politeness in public life. They're the tools of the patriarchy, the white supremacists. Like we need to, you know, I don't want that respectability politics, you know, like right. we need less civility and politeness in public life that have been shackles of, you know, justice and equity. So we need to, uh, we need less in, in, in public life. And I say, actually, both these contingents make the error of conflating these ideas, as is often the case. So I argue politeness is manners, it's etiquette, it's external stuff, whereas civility is internal. It's a disposition of the heart. It's a way of seeing others as our moral equals who are worthy of a bare minimum of respect just by virtue of our shared moral status as members of the human community. And that crucially, sometimes actually loving someone, actually respecting someone, requires being impolite, breaking the rules of propriety, engaging in robust debate for the sake of a greater good. Actually, you know, saying, I'm, I'm, I love you and I'm going to take, I mean, I take you, I'm gonna, I respect you. I'm going to take your ideas seriously. And I'm not, I'm not going to patronize you and pretend a difference doesn't exist here or pretend I agree with you and I don't. I'm going to respect you enough to take your ideas seriously and tell you that I dis, that I disagree. Right. And that might even risk offending someone, hurting someone's feelings. And we have to be willing to do that. That's a way to actually love and respect others. But the thing is, we're afraid to do that today. We think that we just, we just all want to be nice, yeah. and, you know, but right. that's, that's actually deeply patronizing, condescending, and it's not uh, a recipe for productive human social flourishing. We, we either want to be nice or in the case of political difference, I, I interviewed a gentleman who's written a book about polarization in politics, and politics. And his thing is that We've always had political differences. What's dangerous and changed so much now is that when someone has a political difference, I then dislike them as a person. Right. And so what I think you're getting at, and by the way, you quote some of the greats. I'll I'll read one from from Martin Luther King uh, where you said, Dr. King's philosophy of personhood helps us recover the moral foundation of civility, the basic duty we have to all people, including those who are unlike us, who disagree with us, or can do nothing for us in return. And I think that who disagree with us thing has been so lost that we just, if you're on this other side of the political divide, then forget it, you're dead to me. We we have nothing to talk about. (laughs) And that, that's a really bad place to be. While we tend to think we have it particularly bad here in the US, when it comes to a decrease in civility, Lexi Hudson points out that we're seeing this trend around the world, and it's time, she says, to help people be a little more gentle everywhere. As I said, I do love learning etymologies, and knowing that polite comes from the Latin polire, or polish, is a helpful way to understand the differences, Lexi points out, between politeness and civility. And with civility, there's the key attribute of recognizing others as equals, not necessarily agreeing with them on all things, but honoring their right to their opinions and beliefs. Now, back to our conversation. There's a reason I, 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 I drew from people across history and across culture. Many people who read this book will be familiar with at least a few names, but, but I hope yeah. there are many names that are unfamiliar because these are names from other cultures, other, other eras, other parts of the world that aren't in kind of the great, you know, books, Western canon, the, this, this, but right. because this is, my book is about the nature of the good life and timeless principles of human flourishing that people have reflected on independent of one another across history and place. Um, they have said, you know, what works when it comes to doing life well together and what doesn't work? So let's do more of what works and less of what doesn't. And there's a remarkable continuity because human nature doesn't change. These minds, independent of one another, have, have come to the same timeless principles. It's, you know, civility is the art of human flourishing. It is the bare minimum of respect that we are owed and owed to others by virtue of our shared dignity and personhood. And it is more than just politeness. It requires sometimes telling hard truths in order to actually love, actually respect someone, not just polishing over, papering over difference, but, um, you know, embodying the mores, the habits, the conducts, the duties of citizenship, which is the etymological root of civility, comes from the Latin civitas, which is the root of civilization, city, citizen, and citizenship. And that what's amazing is that 
this hasn't changed. There's a lot about our moment that is novel um, and presents new challenges, but at, at, we, but but we haven't changed as 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 as, as a human species, and so that the root cause of this problem, you know, in, in our inherent self love, you know, our, our tendency to to think of ourselves before others, that is like the the gravitational pull, a, a, a core aspect of who we are as human beings, that prevents this other core aspect of who we are from flourishing, the, the social, the part that becomes fully human in, in relationship with others. And that's comforting to me that like, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can, we can look and, and draw from this core of human wisdom that, that can help us live life better right now. Yep. Yeah. And I, and I like the way you emphasize in the book too. We can, and I believe this in just about everything we talk about on this podcast is that we can wait for others. We can wait for the government. We can wait for media to snap at it, but we can wait for Facebook to change their policies on this setting. But a lot of it's up to us and as individuals and it'll grow from individual effort. And I really appreciate that. I mentioned social, I mentioned Facebook. It wouldn't be a podcast episode of mine without some mention of social media because we often get to a place like you're describing our society today and we think about, well, what's changed? Why is this happening? And often social media is the target. And I think often with with fair reason. But you had a you had another line from someone else, George Orwell, who died in 1950. So I don't know when he said this, but it was at least, you know, 70 plus years ago. And you describe him talking about the dawn of radio and how disgusted he was that families would turn on the radio at dinner time and not talk to each other. And it that really resonated with me because I get really disappointed or anxious when I go to a restaurant and I see a family sitting down to dinner and each one of them takes out a phone and looks at it. I bring that up because I think what we're dealing with now have been issues that have been around for a long time, but it has reached a point where we need to push back. So can you talk about social media? You offered some practical tips and we can go through those, but what are your thoughts on social media's impact or you know is it is there a causal relationship between social media and where we are today and then what can we do about that because social media is not going anywhere it's exactly correct i know i love that line from orwell because it's such a great reminder that there is nothing new under the sun that there's been this apocalyptic tendency across across time and place for example the apostle paul thought he was living in the end times he literally thought that the antichrist was you know around on the rise. Um, so did Martin Luther. Martin Luther, who started the Protestant Reformation, thought the Pope was the Antichrist, you know, and and it's not just this, uh, the, that apocalypticism isn't just in, you know, Christian circles or evangelical circles, although although it is, even to this day. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, but, but people have always had this tendency to kind of simultaneously embrace new technology and then rapidly be skeptical of it. And then we're kind of right. in, this, in this moment right now where we're, you know, we've kind of unthinkingly embraced the, this new technology of social media and smartphones. And now people are like, wait, 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 let's slow down. Like maybe this is the end of the world and we're destroying our minds and our kids' minds, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that it's so fascinating and, and helpful to, re- to remind ourselves that this is this is not a new conversation. In fact, that the, the, uh, another you know, historical parallel of of this this apocalyptic tendency and um, is 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 was was in response to a technology that is now considered the single greatest invention in human history, which is the Gutenberg printing press. Absolutely. But there was hysteria about the Absolutely. Gutenberg printing press. Like sure. you know, people tried to um, license it, shut it down. You couldn't have a printing press without uh, without without a license. That the church hated it, political authorities hated it because all of a sudden it democratized information, and there wasn't just right. one source, the church or the political authorities that could have information. Everyone had it and could print whatever they wanted. And this is this is you know, Martin Luther was one extremely savvy user of this early social media where he printed. The, the Protestant Reformation never would have happened without the Gutenberg printing press, where he, he printed this hate speech and this fake news, right, in his pamphlets and then disseminated them widely. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's why we have the Protestant Reformation today. And of course, today, we know that we, we look back on that era and we see it as this time of proliferated literacy. And, you know, it, it led to, of course, um, several decades of, of religious wars, but then the enlightenment, you know, <laughs> where there, and, and you know, there, right, the, right, right. we look back on the, the printing press and we say, okay, net good, unalloyed good. We say that now with that time of like 500 years of history, but we're in the thick of this big change now with, with these new social medias uh, and technologies 
destabilizing the world at life as we know it, threatening democracy, threatening, you know, our friendships, our communities. And that scares us. The unknown really frightens us, especially with the, with the advent of AI. And my friend Sherry Turkle of MIT is working on a fabulous new book right now that I cannot wait to read about how, you know, we're so dependent on technology and on so many ways. And we just kind of use it unthinkingly. And we fail to recognize the way that technology is actually forming us, shaping us, and in fact, even eclipsing our humanity. Mm. And, and she talks about this trend of people having AI boyfriends, girlfriends, partners, relationships, or even AI therapists, you know, where we're not going to our fellow human beings for these really intimate relationships anymore. We're, we're afraid of, we were talking about this earlier, we're afraid of vulnerability. We're afraid of rejection right. and a computer will never reject us. So why right. not just be content with that? We're, we're willingly, blindly exchanging the foe for the real. We're letting the foe take the place of the real. And we, we fail to recognize how that is changing us and that that is changing our humanity, eclipsing our humanity. So it's there. There, there are lots of reasons to be concerned, um, and, and uh, you know, I'm riveted by these these conversations right now. But also really comforting to know that this is not a new question of how technology is changing society. Right. Even radio. When radio first came out, it was like, oh, it's going to bring everyone together. It's going to be great, and and it did. And then. You know, people like Hitler used it for ill and, and you know, so it, it, and then now it's pushed back and I don't think anyone blames radio for any of our problems today, right? But now it's, now it's social media and I, and I appreciated this part of your book because you actually give some practical advice, uh, which doesn't always happen in, in uh, works like yours. And I, I always push people to, I don't, I don't believe that anyone's going to just quit social media altogether. That would, might be a good thing. Who knows? There are some very good positives about social media, I think. But, you know, be careful who you follow. Don't don't be following people that simply enrage you. And then you also get into a few things. And, and I'll just say the first that uh, the list that I saw that or I recall is don't forget there's a human on the other side. And to me, first of all, there's an other side to this medium. So when you're listening to the radio, it's a one way conversation. Social media has really changed things because it's two way and it's two way where both sides can be fairly anonymous and or and or you know who they are, but they can't like, they're not in the same room with you. They're not looking you in the eye. So uh, can you talk about, don't forget there's a human on the other side. It's it's such a great point. I mean, I talk about this in the book that the, the tendency of dehumanization, depersonalization with not just, um, you know, social medias and, 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 um, on the internet, you know, that, that, but even, you know, sending emails, being on the phone with someone, these are all, modes of communication that are digitally mediated and where our humanity is diminished to some extent. We're not like even you and I right now, we're not, this is not, this is a cheap replacement for being in a room with you, Bill, and like looking at you in the eye. And like, you know, we, we learned this during the pandemic very painfully that there is no replacement, no virtual medium is a, is a perfect replacement for the inhabited corporeal experience of sharing a space with someone. We're designed for that. We need it. We need, you know, we need to be with others. And, you know, people talked about Zoom fatigue, which I certainly have these days. I almost only do phone calls now if I have to have phone calls at all. You know, people where our brains are working overtime to like pick up on the minutia of like of, of, the, of the eye, the movements, the body, the facial, the body, the body language that we take for granted and in, in, in sitting face to face with someone. And it's exhausting and, and depleting. It's funny. I saw on social media the other day, the other day someone, you know, said, had a, had, a, had a clip of like, you know, in, in 2008, we paid for ringtones. I remember paying for ringtones, you know, like I would oh, pay yeah. cents for, you know, the latest Britney Spears right. song or something like that. And today, you know, my phone is perpetually on silent. And it's just like how things change. Like I miss calls all the time. If someone That's calls so me, like I virtually yeah. never answer my phone ever. It's like, I'll listen to right. the voicemail. I'll decide whether I, I'll usually text and be like, do you need something? Right. Like, can this be right. done? It's like, it's exhausting to like get on the, so on the phone with someone and answer right. a phone. And so anyways, it's, it, 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 we, we have to stay mindful though of the personally on the other side of these interactions, like these, these digitally mediated communications are gifts, they're privileges. Like we can do things that we haven't been able to do for most of human history. We can collaborate. We can um, have friendships, you know, with people across the world, stay in touch with them. There are really beautiful elements of these new technologies, but they are poor replacements for the in-person experience. And they do, they do diminish the uh, the personhood of the other. So especially, you know, also, also remind, remember that no one, 
ever goes to Twitter to have their mind change and, and illuminated, right? So like avoid the, te- the temptation to like lecture people. And I, you know, I, I, I love, I read this somewhere once, like if you want help with research on something, don't go on Twitter and ask for help with research. Don't like ask for crowdsource information. Go on and state something blankly that you know to be the opposite of what you need, but the opposite of like, <laughs> something that you know not to be true. And then have everyone will, will pile on and correct you and like direct you to actually what you need. So it's like, you know, genius. You know, yeah. So no one goes to Twitter to like be illuminated, have their mind changed. So like, don't waste your time and energy like debating strangers on the internet. It probably wouldn't be a Blue Sky episode if I didn't make at least one reference to history. In this case, as a reminder that while many of our challenges today might feel new, they're just updated versions of older ones we've grappled with for centuries. Cases in point are George Orwell's mention of radio during dinner time, the periodic apocalyptic panics that Lexi references, and the many dangers people feared would be unleashed by inventions like, of all things, the printing press. Lexi makes important points about how today's technologies do present some newer challenges though, with digitally enabled platforms facilitating seamless two-way conversations, while also making it easy to forget that there's another person on the other side. Getting back to my Blue Sky conversation, with Lexi Hudson, the author of Soul of Civility, I wanted to ask her about the part of her book where she writes that it's okay to sit out some of the arguments going on around us all the time. Uh, you also said something I really appreciate, and I'll, I'll share another quote from uh, someone else I interviewed. You said, you don't need to have an opinion on everything. And uh, Kevin Kelly, who I interviewed, uh, said something similar. He said, you don't need to attend every argument you're invited to. <laughs> right. And I think we, we're expected now, and it happens in organizations, it happens with individuals, an event will happen, an issue will come up and it's, what's your opinion on this? Where are you coming out on this? Why haven't you issued a statement? If you issue a statement, what's it going to say? It's like, I don't even have all the facts yet. I don't really have expertise in this area. I really don't have an opinion, you know, and almost that's almost taken as wishy-washy or clueless or, so could you talk a little bit about that? Cause I think it's a really important idea. Cause I think when people get online, it's like, oh, there's an argument. I better jump in. Oh my heavens. I know it's so, it's so <laughs> funny. Cause like there's an expectation in the world today that you don't just have to have an opinion on anything, but you have to have an, uh, the right opinion on everything. This is a, this is actually a really interesting case today of this is right around when my book came out. Actually, my book came out October 10th, 2023. That was three days after Hamas invaded Israel. And all of a sudden, my week's publication, my publication week's media like dried up. And, you know, sure. kids were being sure. slaughtered. There were more important things sure. to talk about. And no one had an appetite for civility when, again, kids were being slaughtered. This was war. This is existential. The only, the only thing worse for a book launch then Israel's 9-11 is, is actual 9-11. And I was actually on the phone yes. with um, Andrew Roberts, an incredible um, military historian who um, is a member of the, the UK House of Lords and attended my book talk at the House of Lords ah. just a few weeks ago. And I was in London. Wow, I got to meet him there. Cool. It was a real honor and a privilege. And he's like, I see you and I and I raise you. My book my, one of my last book books came out on 9-11, which, you know, died or it was dead on arrival, essentially. It's, it's horrible. And um, anyway, there was a lot of pressure on me, you know, from from just the world to like, if I wanted my book to get any traction, I had to talk about Israel and I had to talk about what was going on. And I right. didn't, you know, I, of course I empathized. Of course it was, it, it, you know, broken. It was, I'm a mother, like it was, but I just, I'm not an expert and I didn't feel qualified and I didn't feel like I personally could add anything and contribute to the dialogue. I, and I think, in, I, and I think in book promotion is also exploitive. It's, it's sort of, I think, I think it, it can be exploitive to use the Hamas Israel conflict to sell your book. It's not what your book's about. Right. And, and you don't have to share an opinion or a this position exactly on it because right. it's complicated and it's not your business. Exactly. And so that, you know, that was a decision I made that I'm not going to. This, so this is a common marketing technique. They call it news jacking. Like whatever the news cycle is of yeah, the day, right. like insert what you want to say into it, like co- co-opt it, co- convert it to what you want to say and, and take right. it and spin it. Right. And I just wasn't willing to do that. I, I couldn't, I didn't, I, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I didn't. 
and, and yet internally I did double down and resolve to, you know, to my book promotion efforts because my book is a humanistic manifesto. It is extolling the gifts of being human in these deeply divided times that we live in, which you need in times of war, when the stakes feel existential, in times of election, where the stakes feel like really high. And that's where we're most tempted to cut corners and instrumentalize the other, you know, like this famous line attributed to Stalin and other dictators that, you know, in order to make an omelet, you have to break a few eggs, <laughs> you know, like that, that sort of, that is that what's, what's harmful about that sort of thinking and rhetoric is that it instrumentalizes others. It sees people as, you know, just eggs as part, you know, means to an end, eggs being made into an omelet, right? Not seeing other people as human beings in and of themselves worthy of a bare minimum of respect just by virtue of our shared moral status as members of the human community. And so I made that decision, you know, not to contribute, not really to weigh in on there are way, way more thoughtful people on this topic. And I was happy to listen and learn and just kind of observe, observe. and grieve in silence. So, you know, I, I talked about this um, when I, 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 I spoke at the English House of Lords on my birthday, April 15th, just a few weeks ago. And, and what I brought up at there is that as another m- memorable thing that happened on April 15th in 2019 was the burning of Notre Dame. And I grieved, like I just, I saw the burning of Notre Dame oh, that was and just so like sad. lamented that was so the sad. tragedy of this, of this masterpiece of like, you know, just the human tradition. And what I was astounded by in the wake of the burning of Notre Dame was how people couldn't just say, this is a tragedy. Like, let's just grieve. You know, they said, here's a tragedy, but I'm going to use it and see it, view it through my political lens. Like, this is why. You can't trust a socialist in government, right? right? This is why we need more funding right. for public institutions, you know? Like, right. and, and so people just took that crisis and, and they spun it to, 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 to purvey and promote whatever it is that they want, their, their talking points, right? whatever, whatever it is that, that, that they wanted to talk about anyways. And there's just such a tendency to do that in our world, in our world right now. And um, it, it's really hard to resist that temptation just to be silent and be like, you know what? They're... I can't control that. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about something that I can't, you know, add value to the conversation about. And that's, right. that's hard for someone, especially in political life, especially someone trying to promote a book. Uh, if someone in public life, like I can't imagine, I feel empathy, deep empathy for columnists who have this pressure to have like original and thoughtful things to say three to five times a week. It's like, no one does. <laughs> no one is that interesting. No, that's brutal. That's brutal. <laughs> Well, so that that leads me to to another quote I'd like to share. I, I love Blaise Pascal too, and he's in your book. And um, because I think one of the things you're describing too is I think I worry about people, myself included, where we're so because we have this computer in our pocket that connects us to almost anything. We get in an elevator, we check our phone. We we're, we're multi We're in a meeting. I watch people check their phones. Very, very rude, by the way. Um, we get on an airplane and there's internet. And so we're answering emails. Pascal said, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And that, I hadn't heard that quote before, but, and I tend to be more introverted than most people think when they meet me. I think that's really important. I think that we constantly feel like we either have to be reading the latest, getting a, t- a text update on the, some news development. You're alone, but you're not because you're reading about things going on in the world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I found that really refreshing and you don't hear many people making that point these days. It's such a great line from Pascal. And I mean, he wrote this in the 1600s, right? He wrote this. Right, exactly. Another point. This is These are not new issues. And funnily enough, he was, so I love the story of Pascal. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm always like, a, part of my pride, my life's work and the project of this book is to, is to give unsung heroes of history, of wisdom, of thoughtfulness, of prudence, the depth that they're due, that are often overlooked in history, that aren't, aren't you know, dominating. They're not the common familiar figures. And, and part of my life's work is to revive these stories. And I, Pascal is one of my favorite thinkers. And so he was this incredible geometric mind. He was an inventor and scientist, and he invented an early prototype of the calculator and um, of, of the computer rather in, the, in like the first, in the first calculator. And so, um, and so he, 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 even though he excelled in this, in this world and like knew a lot about the, the technology world, he, he knew its limitations as well and knew of the frailty of, of the human condition. He said, human con- the human condition, man is defined by greatness 
and wretchedness. We're the pinnacle of the created world and also capable of deep, you know, barbarism and, and monstrosity. And Pascal, he actually had this kind of radical conversion experience to Christianity. Uh, he called it his night of fire, where he just like experienced God in a really powerful way. And he abandoned all of his scientific and intellectual pursuits and cared only about knowledge of God. So he kind of locked himself in like a monastic room and he didn't really see anyone. He was always kind of sickly and in poor health. And I, you know, this isn't, this is a really extreme kind of lifestyle choice that I, I wouldn't exactly recommend. But he, he locked himself in a room and didn't really see anyone when he did did see people, he made sure to wear this coat of nails that he would jab himself and stab himself so that he wasn't like enjoying it too much. He didn't want anything to distract him from his love of God. So, you know, a little extreme, wouldn't recommend wow. that, but you know, he was just very <laughs> mindful of the, the, the perils of distraction from the most important things in life, not unlike Socrates and, and many other thoughtful people before him in this space, you know, and, and he wrote after he died, while well, he was working on a book of Christian apologetics um, and analyzing the human condition and, and, and really the, the, the malaise of modernity and the modern mind, the modern psyche. And he said, the human condition is defined by a, 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 an obsession with divertissement. He called it distraction, diversion. He says that we are constantly inventing trivialities and things to just like keep us busy and baubles and dramas. And, and he's like, that is the human. And, and this is where, this is the context in which he offers that famous aphorism that, that all of man's misery stems from his inability to sit alone in a quiet room. And the reality is in our current moment, like he wrote this 400 years ago, but this is even more exquisitely true now where we have constantly like we're bombarded with an overstimulated with with things and demands on our attention and time and the reality is that you know we 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 need we need solitude to have a sense of self, to know who we are, what we stand for, what we believe in, what we want out of life. And we need to have a sense of self in order to have authentic, true, and beautiful human relationships and connections with others. I do believe we'd all do well to embrace this idea that we don't always need to have an opinion on every issue under the sun. Somehow our culture has moved us in the direction of not only thinking that we do, but also that it's then our job to convince others to come to our side, and if we can't, to condemn them for disagreeing with us. And back to today's challenges being ones that have been with us forever, how about Blaise Pascal commenting on our inability to sit quietly in a room alone in the 17th century? Now to our final Blue Sky segment with Lexi Hudson. I'd like you now, as we wrap up, well, I want this can be your send off to our listeners. Okay. Let's paint a picture. This book sells wildly. People read this book, it's wildly successful, and they not only read it, but they act on it. Paint a picture for how society will improve based on the lessons in your book, how, how things will feel differently when we can get back to civility, not just politeness, but civility. My book is a handbook for everyday Americans, everyday citizens to, again, create this warmer, brighter world that I aspire to create for my children, for future generations. And it, 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 encourage, it, it shows readers how to start right now. We vastly, drastically underestimate the power we each have to be a part of the solution in our everyday. And so a world in which my book is a run runaway bestseller and everyone's read it and everyone's taken the principles to heart is as a world where people know their neighbors. It's a world where people don't overlook the everyday junctures of interactions with others, the anonymous, you know, countless utilitarian interactions we have with our Uber drivers, the clerk at the grocery store, where we look people in the eye and we acknowledge them. We see them, we know them, and we make them feel seen and known and loved. And it's a world of, of less loneliness and greater warmth and intimacy and hospitality where we 
readily invite people into, into our home and around a shared meal. We entertain ideas and people um, that we deeply disagree with. We're not just practically hospitable, porching, having dinner parties, you know, or even just, ha- you know, holding court at a coffee shop. It doesn't have to be, you know, many people don't have a space to have a home at, to, to welcome people to their home or don't feel, feel comfortable. And that's okay. You don't have to have a physical space. It could be, it's just an emotional disposition, the disposition of civility that empowers us to create community wherever we are. It can be out, it can be anywhere, it can be on the street. Uh, we can be intellectually hospitable. We're not essentializing people to one aspect of who they are and saying, I know everything about you because of your view on Donald Trump or the COVID vaccine, but saying, you know, you are complex. Every one of us are infinitely complex. And I want to know your story. I'm going to stay curious about who you are and why you are the way that you are, as I hope that you're curious about me too. Cause I, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. I, I have, you know, I'm mistaken. I've mistaken. I've made me, I have thoughts that you disagree with on X, Y, Z issue. Like just as a, it's a world of greater vibrancy socially, intellectually as well. We're curious and we're growing and we're enjoying and, um, delighting in the diversity that, that is before us and not diversity in like the cheapened simplicity sense where it's like, you know, you're a different skin color, but like, that's just one, you know, your skin, color, you know, your religion, your political, belief, that is just one aspect of who you are. I want to strive instead to see in the fullness of you, who you are, as I want you to see me in the fullness of who I am and not just essentialize and reduce you. That's dehumanizing. And that's so simplistic. And that's, that's how our, that's the, the language in which our world traffics and operates. It is so um, detrimental. Uh, and so it's it's a world where we are seen and known and loved in the fullness of who we are. And that is a practice that is just a part of the air we breathe. Fantastic. So I will do my small part by encouraging people to read The Soul of Civility. The author is Alexandra Hudson, aka Lexi. I thank you very much for your time. I know this has been a very busy book tour, some really impressive venues, and I'm thankful that you made room in your schedule for the Optimism Institute and the Blue Sky Podcast. Thanks so much, Bill. Such a pleasure to be with you. Lexi hit on a lot of themes here that have run through many of our previous Blue Sky conversations. Things like community and curiosity, seeing and hearing other people, and understanding the power of our responses and how the way we behave in the world can have ripples in ways we might never imagine. I hope you enjoyed this Blue Sky Conversation with Lexi Hudson. Please tell us what you thought by leaving us a rating or review. And to be sure you don't miss any other episodes in the future, subscribe to Blue Sky wherever you get your podcasts, including on YouTube. All graphic design and cover art for Blue Sky and the Optimism Institute are provided by Crush Graphics. That's Crush with a K. If you'd like to check out more of their fantastic work at crushgraphics.com. And all of our Blue Sky episodes are made possible by the incredible editing and mixing done by the team at Sound On Studios. You can learn more about their work at soundonstudios.com. Until next time, I'm the founder of the Optimism Institute and host of Blue Sky, Bill Burke. And I thank you for listening.